Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in this episode, we have an interview with Nelio Bugallo, also known as Jay Jurassic. You might have heard him on Jurassic Park Podcast before. He's a regular over there. We have Dinosaur of the Day, Sukomimus. We have a ton of dinosaur news. Some weeks are like really heavy. This week's pretty nuts. And we want to give an especially big thank you to our patrons at the $5 level, Scotty, Jackson, Megan, and Eric. And Eric just joined this week. So thanks, Eric. Big warm welcome. Thank yeah. you to everybody. We really appreciate it. And we're so happy to see our community growing on Patreon. So if you want to get in... Check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yeah. And again, this week, we don't have a sponsor other than ourselves. <laughs> so we're promoting our new t-shirt that's now up on Teespring. And there's a link in the episode notes. So head over there to Teespring and grab our shirt if you're interested. And if you're at that $10 or the $20 level, you'll get a either discount code or a free shirt, depending on which level you're at. It's an Allosaurus, and it was illustrated by Josh Cotton. Yeah, it's really cool. And you can find his other work at The Doodling Dino. And if you're interested in becoming a patron on Patreon, you can still come in at the $10 or $20 level, and we'll give you that discount or free shirt, depending on which one you come in at. But this is going to be a limited time offer as most of the shirts on Teespring are, so if you're interested in getting the shirt, make sure you head there soon. First in the news, we've got a new dinosaur, because we always like to announce those first whenever there is one, and this one's called Isaberisora molensis, and it's believed to be a close relative to Calindodromius, although it's quite a bit bigger at 5 to 6 meters or 16 to 20 feet in think, estimated length. Do you think it was just as fast? Uh, yeah, could be. I mean, sometimes the bigger dinosaurs are actually faster, and it's got the same kind of body plan, the bipedal ornithischian kind of look to it. This one's from the mid-Jurassic. It's about 170 to 180 million years old, roughly. And like I said, it's an ornithischian, but it does seem to be a very early ornithischian and even has some stegosaur sort of traits. Basically, the shape of its skull is kind of unusual for an ornith ornithischian. And it was found in Argentina, and it's named after Isabel Berry, who found it. Thus, Isabelle. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a poor manto of her first and last names. It's a pretty good one. Yeah, it does make a fun name. It reminds me of like a Pokemon is a berry. <laughs> Seems like it could be one. When they found it, they found most of the skull. They got a bunch of teeth, vertebrae, ribs. They got a shoulder blade, parts of the hips, and then what they called a lot of unidentifiable fragments, which I don't usually see mentioned in these papers. That could be anything. Yeah, exactly. And I, I was thinking, if it's an unidentifiable fragment, how do we even know that it's part of the Isabelle Sora, but I guess maybe it's all mixed in with it, so we just kind of assume. And when you look at the amount that they recovered, it's kind of like the top third of the dinosaur. So we don't have any of the legs or the arms or the back of the tail that might have been a little lower. It's just kind of that front, like the bust kind of of the dinosaur. And when they looked at the teeth, they thought that it seemed like it would probably be omnivorous, which is what we see in a lot of that kind of medium to medium large sized ornithischians. But they actually had really well preserved gut contents. And oh, I love when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> is that a joke or like? No, really? I'm being serious. Okay. I like knowing because then you know for sure that that's what they ate. That's true. Yeah, it is really cool. And they found preserved seeds from cycads, and they're really well preserved because apparently the Isabelle Sora didn't chew its food, so they're completely unchewed. And then it was probably early in the digestive process because it doesn't look like it's broken down much. And you can actually see the different layers and details of the seed itself, which is how they managed to identify it as a cycad seed. The authors also note that cycads, at least modern cycads, because 
these plants that were around during the dinosaur time are still sometimes around today. And cycads are, they kind of look like a fern, but they have these really stiff, almost cactus-like little leaves sticking out. It's just exactly the kind of plant you would imagine being around in the Jurassic. Yeah. When you see a lot of these illustrations. Yeah, yeah. They're really popular and they look cool too. I actually used to have one in a pot and I really like it. But apparently they have toxic chemicals in their seeds and on their leaves to try to prevent from being eaten. And so Isabarisora probably had some kind of fancy gut flora to help digest these seeds. And that could explain a little bit of why it was so big, because some herbivorous dinosaurs got really big so that their guts could do fancier digestion <laughs> than the smaller animals could. So it was pretty cool. They also found some seeds from other plants. And unfortunately, they think based on the teeth it was omnivorous, but they couldn't find any animal remains or anything that indicated any sort of No good gut predation. contents there. Yeah. Just just seed gut contents. <laughs> But one dinosaur that we do know is carnivorous is Velociraptor. And I know that we've talked about the fighting dinosaurs before. They're the two dinosaurs discovered in Mongolia, a Velociraptor and a Protoceratops, that were kind of embraced in a combat position. And they fossilized in that exact position. So it's a really awesome find. It's one of the coolest fossil discoveries of all time. Now there's some more research looking into how they got in the exact position that they fossilized in. So I didn't really notice it looking at it the first time, but the velociraptor claws, the kind of forelimb claws, are kind of attached to the protoceratops head, and then its big, meaty, attacking claws are where it, the protoceratops stomach and guts would have originally been. So it looks like they got frozen in that position. But then... If you look at it more closely, they're farther apart than you would imagine if they were fighting. It looks almost like when you're a kid and you're like slap fighting at somebody else's hands and you're in like the backseat of a car. They're kind of in that sort of position where their bodies are a lot farther apart than you'd expect. And the researchers looked at the fight or tried to reconstruct the fight, I should say. And they broke it down into the following steps. So they said, you've got a prancing protoceratops. And they use the word prancing, which I really enjoy. Good alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> and I think prancing is actually a pretty good description because they're moving on their hind legs, but they would have, you know, been not the most stable on their hind legs, I don't think. So it's, it's prancing along. And then a velociraptor jumps on its head. Oh, <laughs> So both of them fall down, and the protoceratops might have landed on top of the velociraptor. So the protoceratops is prancing before the attack? Yeah, and it might have kind of reared up onto its hind legs to try to protect itself seeing the velociraptor, but obviously there's no way we'd, we would know that. Mm. So then the protoceratops falls onto the velociraptor, possibly injuring it, and then the velociraptor stabs into the protoceratops' stomach with its claws. Ugh. Yeah. Won't be seeing those gut contents. <laughs> well, you probably would have at the time. It just didn't fossilize. <laughs> yeah. So after they mentioned this kind of attack and they said that's, a, that's the way a lot of modern cats basically attack things. They'll kind of leap onto something and then try to like get at the soft part of the animal with their big claws. So it, it makes sense <laughs> that a velociraptor would do this. Just had a friend tell a story about when she got a kitten and she opened the box that it was in to take a look at it and it flew out onto her face and then started scratching her cheeks. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that does sound very similar. But luckily it had cute little kitten claws that couldn't Yeah, so it didn't really her. hurt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the kitten's instinct. Yeah, yeah. Just like a little mini velociraptor you keep in your house. <laughs> <laughs> so... After the claws are stuck in this protoceratops, the protoceratops seems to have gotten yanked backwards away from the velociraptor, and it's unclear why it got yanked. So they might have already been dead, and it might have been something trying to eat the protoceratops, like a scavenger, 
Or it might have been that the Protoceratops was a member of a herd or something, and the herd came around and tried to protect the Protoceratops while it was still alive and pull it away. In either case, it didn't work. So the claws are still stuck in the Protoceratops, and they couldn't, you know, unattach them or they gave up part of the way through. So they got left in that position, and then it got buried in sand. So it's unclear exactly how they got separated, but something was yanking on it, and it left them in this kind of weird position, and we're not really sure why, but it but does then, look like they were probably fighting. So even if the Protoceratops died first, the Velociraptor had to have died pretty soon after. Exactly. That's why they're saying maybe the Protoceratops fell on top of the Velociraptor or something, or you could have had that herd of other protoceratops come over and kill the velociraptor and you know but it was too late to save the other protoceratops it's really impossible to say at this point but one of the things they were doing was just trying to see if there was any possible evidence for the velociraptor coming by to scavenge it or you know the protoceratops going and encountering a dead velociraptor for some reason but there wasn't anything there because you wouldn't see these claws the attacking claws digging in if it wasn't attacking it, you know, if it was scavenging, it would just be pecking at it with its mouth, not all of its limbs at once. Right. So still the coolest probably fossil ever. The fighting dinosaurs. Yeah. It's and a good it, name. Yeah. And I really like that they're digging back into it a little bit to see what else we can learn from it. Speaking of cool things we can learn from dinosaurs, sort of. You'll see what I mean. Anyway, according to Gadgets Now and ABC, there's a team of scientists in Melbourne, Australia, who are working to combine virtual reality and 3D printing to teach people about dinosaurs. So researchers from Deakin University are showing students what a paleontological dig is like, and there's going to be an exhibit at Geelong's National Wool Museum. There's going to be a 3D printed dinosaur based on Wayelinosaurus, an ornithopod, which we talked about in a previous episode, and visitors will be able to look around a dig and see video and hear the audio, that's the virtual reality part, and then at the end you can touch this 3D printed dinosaur, which scientists think had scaly skin, like an eastern blue tongue lizard, so the print will feel scaly and be contoured to fit the dinosaur and be based on this blue tongue lizard skin. Cool. Cool. So the VR experience is based on a real dig in what was once a Gondwana riverbed, where scientists and volunteers have found more than 200 bits of bone in 12 days. So that's pretty cool. And Laelinosaurus backdrop will be based on parts of the Geelong Botanical Gardens. And Laelinosaurus was an herbivore. It could run fast, so she'll be depicted as shy and easily scared in the virtual reality. And according to Ben Hornan from Deacon's Virtual Reality Lab, quote, dinosaurs are something that excites most people, including myself. So we thought 3D printing dinosaurs and virtual reality would be a great combination. (laughs) And I agree. I think that's a really great way to experience this without having to go out and, and dig for yourself if you're not able to or if you're like me and just terrible at finding fossils. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I really like the idea of 3D printing dinosaurs. And I also really like the idea of dinosaurs and virtual reality. Both of those should be awesome. Also awesome is uh, Neil Shubin, who's a paleontologist from the University of Chicago, recently came back from his first fossil hunt in Antarctica. And I always like hearing about these trips because Antarctica is so hard to get to. Yeah. And so hard, I'm sure, once you're there. (laughs) So Chicago Tonight reported on his trip, and before going on the trip, Shubin said he and his team had to first physically qualify, which makes sense. They had to apply to the U.S. Antarctic program and then go to the doctor about 20 times before they were cleared. And then once they were at the McMurdo Station in Antarctica, they spent 10 days training for the conditions. So uh, according to Shubin, the places they searched for fossils were quote, like the Grand Canyon, only filled with ice and glaciers, Hmm. which I can only imagine based on the one time I went to the Grand Canyon. It's with Garrett and a group of people, and that was a really uh, taxing hike (laughs) for me. Yeah, Yeah, some of the people in our group got a little bit worn out trying to hike a little too far. Yeah, I was among them. And that was like a, it was a pretty good time to go to. I think it was like the spring, so it was maybe 70 degrees. No, it was August. 
Oh, was it? Yeah. It didn't seem that hot, though. Oh, I guess it's high elevation,、mm-hmm. so it wasn't that hot. Yeah, not like Antarctica, where you'd have to be layered in tons and and probably more slippery. Yeah, that's、ice. true. Yeah, but fortunately, this group found a lot of fossils, both small and large. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about what they found in later papers. Yeah, yeah, that'll be cool. I didn't realize you had to go through so much in order to just go to Antarctica, but I guess it makes sense. It does. It's kind of like going into space. I guess so. Yeah. Except probably not as rigorous. Yeah. Of testing. <laughs> but that's a good point because there's not easy access to doctors and things, so、mm-hmm. they want to make sure you'll be okay the whole time you're there. Next up, we've got some new titanosaur osteoderms that were discovered. Specifically, they found seven pretty nice ones. And they were found in Argentina, which is not surprising since that's kind of the mecca of titanosaurs. And we gotta go. Yeah, we do. There's so much cool stuff in Argentina. I just saw something about all the really cool astronomy that you can do in Argentina and Chile because the skies are so dark. It just looks awesome. Yeah, yeah that's secondary. <laughs> <laughs> I like other sciences too. <laughs> so the. Osteoderms that they found were from the Upper Campanian to Lower Maastrichtian, also known as within 15 million years of the dinosaur extinction event, and most of them are keeled, and that's exactly what it sounds like. They kind of have a ridge running along the middle of one side of the osteoderm. We need more research to figure out what these osteoderms kind of mean and what we can learn from them, but. There's a paper kind of outlining all of the nitty gritty details. If you want to see some nice pictures and information about new osteoderms, I like hearing about when sauropods have this kind of armor on them. Yeah, I want them to find more club tails. I really <laughs> like the idea of sauropods with club tails, just like giant ankylosaurs. Yep. Next, the Environmental Science Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. Published new videos on YouTube about dinosaurs. There's a short clip on what dinosaurs looked like, and another short clip on what dinosaurs sounded like, and those are both taken from the Secret Lives of Dinosaurs talk by Dr. Julia Clark in their series Hot Science Cool Talks. It's their, I think, hundredth episode. If you're interested in watching, definitely、mm-hmm. worth watching. The full talk is about 40 minutes, and Clark does a really great job of introducing what we currently know about dinosaurs to a large audience. So, in the clip about how dinosaurs may have sounded, she talks about Jurassic Park three and their resonating chamber that they made to sound like a Velociraptor, and then how that sounds different from roaring dinosaurs typically depicted in the media, as well as samples of what dinosaurs may have sounded like based on if they had a croc-like sound organ, which sounds similar to a roar, even though it's produced with the mouth closed. And that's similar to birds, such as an ostrich. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a boom we've talked about. Yeah, part of the reason ostriches are so scary. <laughs> anyway, ostriches aren't scary. <laughs> yeah, you're you're taller. You don't you don't get it. <laughs> I'm not as tall as an ostrich, though. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doctor Clark also points out that animals don't really make sounds when attacking, and we. Talked about that before, and how、like, a silent T Rex would actually probably be more scary than a roaring T Rex. Yeah, I think that's kind of a typical scary movie move, where like the villain or whatever is making some big like growl or whatever when they're attacking. But in real life, you don't see like a leopard sneak up on something and then roar right as it's about to attack. That's like the last thing you want to do after spending all that effort tracking something down. Yeah, exactly. Most likely, then dinosaurs made sounds when they're trying to attract mates, which makes a lot of sense. A lot、yep. of bluster and all that stuff. In the segment about what dinosaurs looked like, Dr. Clark talks about、uh, filaments, bristles, and fuzz found in dinosaurs, and how some tyrannosaurids had bristles, and dromaeosaurs had been found with feathers on their arms. And she also talks about how scales were rare and usually found in sauropods or hadrosaurs and other ornithischians that gathered in herds. However, some dinosaurs had scales and feathers, like Cetacosaurus. Yeah, and even things like Euteranus and other dinosaurs, you see where their body, certain parts is covered in feathers, and then parts of their legs or feet aren't. There's a whole spectrum of completely covered to not covered at all. Yeah, and she even brought up an illustration of a triceratops with some bristles on its tail. Yeah, I mean, if、cool. it's on Cetacosaurus, you can imagine it being on other 
ceratopsians. Mm -hmm. Crazy to think about, but anyway, uh, and she had this great quote towards the end of her talk. She says, I want to leave you with a notion that unlike Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, we don't need to keep imagining them, dinosaurs, like we did in the 19th century, 150 years ago, that these new dinosaurs are beautiful and that beauty comes from also a more scientific understanding of their secret lives. Yeah, I completely agree with that. <laughs> doesn't mean that the Jurassic Park movies aren't fun because they're like crazy horror movies, basically. Monster movies, right? Yeah, but no, you shouldn't look at them as scientifically accurate. And it is really hard to separate them when it's the main place you see dinosaurs. And when they were accurate in the first yeah. round. And there's a lot of elements of realism to them. But yeah, we have to realize that that's not a real dinosaur. That's a make-believe version. Next up, there's a relatively new biomechanical study of sauropod skulls. And I say relatively new because it came out at the end of last year, but it took me a while to get through it. <laughs> <laughs> so the aim of this study was basically to learn more about sauropod eating habits. And they wanted to compare how sauropods evolved over time and what the shape of their body and their head and everything could kind of tell us about what they might have been eating. So they looked specifically at the basal sauropodomorph Platyosaurus, as well as a Camarasaurus, which is obviously a more derived, evolved sauropod. So the Platyosaurus kind of has a longer skull, almost like a hadrosaur, versus a much more boxy skull on a Camarasaurus. It's tall, it's like really weirdly tall almost. <laughs> and that's why when it was put on that Apatosaurus, it looked so much different than when they finally found the Apatosaurus skull that's a little bit flatter. It doesn't have that really tall look to it. And what they found by modeling the bite forces with the likely muscles that would have been on the Platyosaurus and the Camarasaurus is that Platyosaurus could probably close its mouth a lot faster than a Camarasaurus. And that might mean that Platyosaurus would have been omnivorous. So it could have chewed on plants pretty well, but it also might have been able to snap shut on some kind of small animal or something. Eat some gut content. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The Camarasaurus, on the other hand, had a much stronger bite force with its musculature and that big bulky head. But it probably couldn't close its mouth as quickly, so it was probably just herbivorous, and it might have been one of the early stages towards developing bulk herbivory and the massive size that sauropods eventually developed. When I think of Camarasaurus, I think of Dinosaur National Monument. Yeah, we have one on our wall, a little baby Camarasaurus. <laughs> I think it's just a miniature version of the, the big one. No, that's a baby one. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, there was a baby one and then there was a big one. It's a really cool dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Next, thanks to Patrick for sharing this one with us via Facebook. The 65th Symposium of Vertebrate Paleontology and Comparative Anatomy and the 26th Symposium of Paleontological Preparation and Conservation will be held in Birmingham, UK, September 12th to 15th this year. There will be presentations, workshops, an icebreaker event, poster presentations, an auction, a dinner, and a field trip. So very similar to the SVP uh, conference that they have in North America. Yeah. And there's also this year going to be a special symposium with the topic about macroevolution and macroecology in the vertebrate fossil record. Sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Next up, there's some more dinosaur eggshells that have been found. And they were found in the Milk River Formation, which is just north of the Montana-Alberta border. So Canada wins this one on the dinosaur discoveries. <laughs> There's so many things that are discovered like right along the Alberta-Montana border. And if it's on one side, it's like Albertosaurus it gets named. And if it's on the other side, then the Americans get to name it. But anyway, they represent five ooh taxa also known as types of eggshell. <laughs> and there's probably one ornithopod and four small theropods. They looked at them pretty closely, and they saw that the eggshells looked to be thinner than previously found eggshells from later in the Cretaceous. And that may mean that these dinosaurs, with the similar eggs to the later Cretaceous ones, might have been smaller than the later Cretaceous. So we might be looking at some eggshells that were thinner because they were smaller overall, 
And then as they evolved bigger, they had to get thicker and more robust because it's not really a full egg. It's just bits and pieces of eggshell. So interesting. Yeah. It's amazing how much you can learn from something like an eggshell. I wonder what a dinosaur omelet would have tasted like. Well, we can get an ostrich one. Actually, you know, because every omelet oh, that no, you've eaten is okay, a dinosaur okay. omelet. Non-avian <laughs> dinosaur. My bad. <laughs> you knew what I meant. <laughs> yeah. I did see something where they were talking about the percentage of yolk that certain birds have. I think it was those mound building, maybe even more like a turkey. And when they get buried in these mounds, they develop a little bit longer and they have more yolk. Hmm. So it probably has more to do with whether or not they were buried eggs versus if they were like modern birds in a nest kind of egg. Interesting. Yeah. Other than that, they probably taste pretty similar. In addition to dinosaur eggshells, we've also got some new dinosaur footprints that were discovered southwest of Beijing. So kind of the opposite side of the planet. But <laughs> these are in the same location where the first ever Chinese dinosaur footprints were found. And it's a place in the Shaanxi province. And they were originally found way back in 1929, the first Chinese dinosaur footprints. But there have been tons of dinosaur footprints found all over China since then. And these new footprints seem to represent four types of likely predatory dinosaurs. So they equate three of them to new species there's a large medium and small dinosaur and then there's also a previously known small dinosaur and again they think they're all predatory so it's interesting i think they're just saying that because they're tridactyl so mm. it makes it look like a theropod print and theropods are pretty much all carnivorous possibly omnivorous although there are some that became herbivorous later so it's not a hundred percent but I think that's what they were basing it on in their paper. Cool. Next, thanks to Patrick again for sharing this one with us via Facebook. According to Birmingham Mail, Birmingham Park will have life-sized dinosaurs for the summer. Dinosaurs will include Triceratops, Diplodocus, Dilophosaurus, which spits like in Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's but important. I, I guess that makes it more exciting. Uh, there's T-Rex and some non-dinosaurs like pterosaurs. It's part of the event Jurassic Kingdom where dinosaurs come to life, which will be at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens in Edgebaston, May 20th through June 4th. It's actually a traveling event that will start on April 1st in Austerley Park and will also make its way to Bristol, Manchester, Blackpool, Glasgow, Newcastle, and Leeds. And there are more than 30 dinosaurs and they're all animatronic, so that would be cool. Yeah, fancy animatronic if someone can spit on you. I wonder if they have like a sneezing sauropod like they had in Jurassic Park too. Oh, that'd be cool. I, th I think it'd be pretty gross, but yeah. Well, it's not actually sneezing. Out. It's just water. It's yeah. like we went to a museum around the holidays in Minnesota and they had an exhibit to teach kids about germs. Oh, yeah. And it was, there's a painting of a kid and then I think you press a button and they sneeze on you, but it's just squirting water. You just opened a little door. It was like the child's face. Yeah. And when you opened it, it sprayed a sneeze and it made a sneeze noise. And all the kids thought it was so funny and they kept doing it over and over again. And all the adults are like, oh, it's so gross. Stop it. Yeah. But I, I think it would be the same way here with that yeah. audience. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> And as a quick follow-up from last week, thanks to our listener John for the update about California's state dinosaur. So apparently on February 17th, which is just a couple weeks ago, a bill was introduced to make Augustinolophus morisi California's state dinosaur. And the state fossil is already a saber-toothed cat, probably because of the La Brea tar pits. So that makes sense. Yeah, we're not going to be able to uproot that guy. And it's probably the best one, too, from the tar pits. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, there's some really nice preservations of fossils from there. We don't have a ton of dinosaurs here in California, but this one's a medium-sized hadrosaur, and we actually saw it when we went to the L.A. Museum of Natural History, tucked away <laughs> in, like, you had to find these stairs and then go up, and there was no one else up there, but it was there like... Wasn't, it wasn't even that large of an area. No, it was like a little, like, corner. It was up. enough to uh, see a small 
thing on the wall about dinosaurs found in California and then mostly the view of the other dinosaurs <laughs> below you. Yeah, you get a better view of dinosaurs from other states. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was cool to see the actual dinosaurs from California. And this means that T-Rex is still up for grabs. So if you're in another state and you want a state dinosaur and you don't have one, I think you should go for T-Rex because nobody's claimed it yet. That's surprising. Yeah. The states where you'd expect there to be T-Rex, both of them went for Triceratops. And there are way more Triceratops found there than T-Rex. I think that's the main reason. Mm. But still not nearly as exciting. Next, TV Overmind reported on James Burroughs, who, along with a group of people, built a 125,000-piece dinosaur-themed Lego park. The model is fully functioning, and it's got a roller coaster, which is named Coaster Saurus 2, based on the Coaster Saurus ride in Legoland, Florida. And Burroughs said that the project combined roller coasters and dinosaurs, quote, what else could you ask for? Which, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> He even took a college course to learn about centripetal forces so he could build a roller coaster that had a drop and goes into a loop. And if you watch the video, you see it works. There's also a River Rapids, which is near Tampa, the real one. And in this Lego theme park, it surrounds a putt-putt golf course. And apparently, most people don't notice the putt-putt golf course because there's so much else going on. <laughs> so... Burroughs said that he's put a lot of hidden Easter eggs into the park. In addition to the golf course, there's monkeys on a bridge as a callback to the game Hydro Thunder, which I'm not familiar with that game, but cool. There's also Richard Hammond and Owen Grady in the park. And he says, quote, I try to build everything the way I actually see it in life. And he has admitted that there's so much in there you won't actually see it all. Yeah, 125,000 pieces is a ton. Mm -hmm. I think when I was a kid, I got some really big boxes of knockoff Legos that had like 5,000 pieces, and I'd never put them all together unless I was just making a giant, you know, like rectangular tower. <laughs> it's so hard to come up with a use for all those pieces. Yeah. It's amazing how much detail and thought has been put into this project. It's, it's impressive to look at. Yeah. It's interesting that it's Richard Hammond, the dude from Top Gear, and not John Hammond, who's the guy from I, Jurassic Park. I don't park. know. I'm just going by what he said in the video. <laughs> yeah. so. It's just funny. It's not possible for me to see. I mean, Burroughs has said it's not possible for everyone to see everything in his park, and it's even harder when you're looking at it through a YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a Where's Waldo? He just put a random Top Gear celebrity in there rather than a Jurassic Park guy. <laughs> well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, last in the news, Geek.com wrote about Hasbro's Toy Fair media briefing, which featured Trypticon, a dinosaur transformer. Trypticon is a large gray and purple T-Rex. The toy's 20 inches tall with working jaws that can swallow tiny transformers. And then, you know, when it swallows it, it comes out of uh, the Trypticon's chest so you can do it all over again. Trypticon can also become a Decepticon spaceship, a Decepticon city, and his head and neck can be turned into a car. So lots of things to do there. Yeah, that is cool. That is, He can become an entire spaceship or city. That's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> but you only need two parts of him to turn into a car. Yeah. <laughs> and before we get into our interview... We quickly want to give a reminder that we have a new shirt on Teespring, and it's an awesome Allosaurus by Josh Cotton, the doodling dino. So if you're interested in getting this t-shirt, head over to Teespring or check the link in our show notes, and you can get the shirt. And now on to our interview with Nelio Bugallo. So we're here today with Nelio Bugallo, who is an artist, and we found him via Instagram, and he has some amazing work. And right now, he is learning to become a tattoo artist. And actually, one of my favorite images on his Instagram is of these uh, three raptors that he tattooed on oranges, I believe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are really cool. <laughs> yeah. And he also has some beautiful dinosaur in egg illustrations, this, these wonderfully detailed feathered dinosaur images you can purchase some of his work on etsy where he sells custom toys and replicas such as jurassic park crates and jurassic park dilophosaurus venom and shirts phone cases prints and more at Redbubble. and you may also be familiar with his work 
as J. Jurassic, as he's known in his dinosaur circles. So you're a contributor now for the Jurassic Park podcast. And can you tell yes, us a bit about the Amber Fine segment? Sure. The Amber Fine segment started actually when I was on a, a guest on the podcast for Jurassic Park podcast. I was on there for like a, like a mini segment for the news of like Mattel being the new company to make Jurassic World toys for the, like it was taken away from Hasbro. Mm-hmm. And then Brad wanted me on, on the show to talk about my collections. I have a huge Jurassic Park collection and the show like that one episode was really good and, and a lot of people loved the whole nostalgia effect of it and and just how I was just I had such a vast collection, such a vast knowledge of Jurassic Park and such a love and passion for the franchise and dinosaurs in general that he had asked me, what do you think about doing a segment about your collection? And I thought it was an awesome idea. And I was like, I don't know if I can. I've never really done a podcast or, <laughs> or YouTube video. I've been a guest on like Victoria's Cantina about talking about Jurassic Park toys, but I don't, I don't know. I, I just, I've never done any of that. And he's like, yeah, just try it out. And so I did. I did the first episode, and people really liked it, and they loved the how I kind of bring them back to like '93 and '97, talking <laughs> about these items, and how I bring them back to like when they were kids. And the love and passion that I put forth each one of these episodes and segments, like you can see how much I care for these items and how much I care for the franchise itself. So it began with just like that idea, that one episode, and it's come out to become something better now having these segments. And now I'm actually evolved it into a segment where I talk to other collectors as well. And that one's like, yeah, it's called uh, Hunters and Gatherers kind of like what they use for the lost world Mm -hmm. yeah that's cool so yeah um that one hasn't come out just yet i just um did a mini interview with one of these collectors and customizers named ted brothers and even with that it was such a great episode like it it hasn't come out yet but just the episode itself that me and him did we were like dude we have to do like more of these (laughs) but just like talking about random stuff of jurassic park and this is the first time I'm really announcing it, but this is like, it's called Jay and Ted's Jurassic Adventures. Oh, um, that's awesome. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it just started out with that and, and the community's really embraced it and it's it's awesome. I love the Jurassic Park community. They're, they're such great people. Yeah. Yeah, it is really fun. We still haven't gotten a single piece of like hate email yet. And we've done over a hundred episodes. I, I was really expecting after like 10, we'd start to get people who you know for what one reason or another really don't appreciate our take on it or something but yeah it's a very positive group yeah yeah we really are there's like there's like two things that really uh rile up the community um (laughs) one of the main ones is the you know the spinosaur versus t-rex fight that that's just like (laughs) no one really talks about it (laughs) because it you mean it's just it's just an argument that goes on forever oh really and yeah, it really does. <laughs> I'm on the side of the fence of T-Rex. So I'll just put that out there. <laughs> oh, people but, think um, like Spinosaurus might have won in that fight? Oh, yeah, definitely. Huh. I yeah. guess. But I go I go by the scientifically accurate Spinosaurus. So, I mean, but then again, like uh, it, it's been turning now kind of the tides have turned a little bit by what Jurassic World introduced and how Wu's like be that that Spinosaurus we saw in Jurassic Park three was actually like Wu's first hybrid. Uh. It's like, and it, it's a really cool fan theory. And I, and I feel if the franchise picks that up, that'd be great because mm-hmm. it would explain a lot. Yeah. You know, how he was so powerful and, and like he had like a, some issues like Michael Myers type serial killer issues. <laughs> <laughs> The way funny. he hunted those humans down, he basically was like <laughs> like a psycho. Yeah. He was acting very human. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wonder. They they really did a good job, I thought, in the most recent Jurassic World, kind of covering the whole, you know, they're not really dinosaurs. They're these monsters. So we know that they have these features that real dinosaurs didn't have. And they, they did a good job with that. And they could easily port that back, especially since they were talking about, you know, the DNA gaps and how they filled it in back in Jurassic Park 3. That's really interesting. I love that too. I really did. I, I appreciated that because it, it kind of gives an explanation to why these dinosaurs are very reptilian looking yeah. and they're missing feathers and whatnot. 
because that's been the biggest argument about this franchise and whatnot. Yeah. You know, back in 93, they were like what we presume dinosaurs to be back in those days. Yeah. I remember buying books, dinosaur books back like 91, 92, and they start to show them with their tails up. And uh, because before that, their tails were always dragging. Mm -hmm. They had like these big pot bellies and they just looked very strange, you know, compared to what they look like a couple years later. And then a complete difference to what they look like now for what we presume they look like now. Because we really, you know, we don't know, but we have enough science to say, well, they don't look like that. Yeah. We think they kind of look like this. I don't know when we'll really ever even know, but unless we find like something beautifully preserved with like feathers everywhere and just like complete proof, you know? Yeah. So when they showed like in Jurassic World that they were still like this without feathers, it was it was a great explanation to why they look like that. And I, I appreciated that too. That speech there too was pretty awesome. Like uh cat looks like a monster to a mouse, I think it was. Or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty cool little like talk that they had with Maserani in between yeah. there. Definitely. I, I kind of want to rile up Jurassic Park fans real quick just by saying <laughs> Spinosaurus would never beat T-Rex if it's not some sort of <laughs> hybridized version. <laughs> there's just nobody. There's no reason. It was like basically semi-aquatic. It like mm -hmm. might have even been quadrupedal. Its head isn't strong enough to do any of that stuff. It just yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the biggest fault that I, I feel is uh, the spine. It's connected. It's it's on its spine. It just the wrong move. It, it crack its entire back and it yeah. did not move. And just like that one headbutt that the T Rex gives in the beginning of the fight mm -hmm. is like enough to put it down and and break its entire spinal cord. Yeah, it was a you know that spine was a big fault that that dinosaur had. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I I, <laughs> I I remember seeing that in the theater and. The first time I actually saw that movie, and I've said this before, I was in the movie theater, really happy to see this. And I remember I didn't go to school that day. I was like, nope, I'm going to go see this movie. <laughs> I was like so excited. And I was like, I knew there was going to be a dinosaur fight in it like that. And I was like, yes, all right. <laughs> Can't wait. I have my big popcorn, my drink. And I sit down and I'm watching it. And like, you know, the fight's like within the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the T-Rex is killed. And I can honestly say the first showing of that movie I ever saw, I don't remember the rest of that movie because I was just, <laughs> I was gone. Like my imagination was just, I, I was dead to that movie because I, I couldn't believe what had just happened. And I remember just leaving that movie so disappointed and just like tears in my eyes. It was like, this movie, what did they do? Like, oh, That's oh. really funny. So you yeah, knew a and, fair amount about dinosaurs before watching that movie then? I did. I did, actually. I love the Jurassic Park franchise, but I always was reading new dinosaur science, and I knew they had feathers and all that, and dromaeosaurs had feathers. Because I had, my mom was very uh, supportive of my dinosaur obsession. Mm -hmm. um, she's pretty much the one to blame for it. She, <laughs> she, she gave me, like, a cake when I was, like, I think, like, six years old. I actually posted it on Instagram not too long ago. I found the picture of the cake that I've told everybody about. That's where dinosaur obsession started. It was <laughs> these, like, really cheap-looking dinosaur toys. But, it, you know what I mean? I never had seen really dinosaurs before that. Coming from Uruguay, that dinosaur obsession of the 90s wasn't there yet. And then, like, I got into Ninja Turtles and Batman stuff, and dinosaurs were really not around. Mm-hmm as much but then when that cake came along and i was like what are those things and they just fascinated me to, <laughs> that these huge giants lived on this earth once past and they're not here anymore it just captured my imagination mm -hmm. and i remember relatives telling me oh you'll get over dinosaurs when you get older and you know in your teenage years you'll start thinking about girlfriends and all that <laughs> stuff and you won't even think about dinosaurs anymore i'm 30 years old and i still obsessed with dinosaurs as much as i was when i was six yeah. it's just like us <laughs> yeah girls and dinosaurs are not mutually exclusive <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, i wanted to be a paleontologist i really did and it's just art took over i was always interested in science and in medicine my mom always thought i was going to become a doctor when i got older because i have books on anatomy where I'd learned the anatomy of animals very young, the anatomy of humans and all that for my drawings. And the first things that actually got me inspired to draw 
and create these monsters that I also create like for my imagination. It's all stems from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were the ones that, that brought in my horizon of drawing from just drawing Batman and Ninja Turtles to actually going in there and drawing all these creatures. And from there, I went to animals. And from animals, I went to mythical monsters. And from mythical monsters to, like, monsters from nightmares and dreams. And it was just that it all branched out from dinosaurs, pretty much. They are the, the stem for all my imagination when it comes to drawing. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for the art, I would have been a paleontologist, but <laughs> the art took over. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Well, neither of us did paleontology either, so we can understand how it's, you get sidetracked by other passions for mm -hmm. sure. But, you, you know, the dinosaurs never go away. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> not at all. So how, when you're doing all these different projects, like you talk about how you do other paleo art, and then you also have tons of art that isn't even related to paleontology, how do you decide what kind of dinosaurs you're going to draw as like the next project? I sometimes just uh, write some of them down that I want to draw. And I've always been interested. I, of course, I'm interested in always drawing the, the very popular dinosaurs like, you know, velociraptors and mm -hmm. And uh, T Rex, T Rex is well. T Rex is my favorite dinosaur, as as cliche as it may be, and and everybody I know, everyone likes T Rex, and it's just my absolute favorite. It and is awesome. <laughs> it, it's yeah, I, and it's just not just Tyrannosaurus Rex. I love all Tyrannosaurids, uh, Abertosaurus, Gorosaurus. There's still that debate with the Nano Tyrannus, but I was fascinated when I heard about the Nano Tyrannus. Mm -hmm. There's still debate whether it is its separate species or whether it is uh, a young T-Rex. And my personal opinion, even though it's an opinion and not in science, I, I feel that it might be a juvenile Rex, but there is a lot of science against it and there's science for it. It's a big debate. But that was one that I was like super obsessed with for like a while. And I remember drawing like sketches in my in my book, like trying to like elongate the jaw a little bit, <laughs> make it look more juvenile. And it's just what dinosaur just pops up in the moment and I feel like drawing it. A while back I did a Styracosaurus, I think it was Styracosaurus that I drew, and it's it's called Tired Warrior. And it's a, <laughs> it's a Styracosaurus that got in a fight with a, a certain predatory dinosaur. And it's got all these like gashes and wounds and it's just limping away on like this like very colorful like watercolor type background but the it looks very comic book but it, it's detailed and it's a beautiful piece that i did a while back and it's just it's just like a dinosaur that just pops into my head and then i feel like drawing it and either i go with more of a reptilian look or well right now i'm in the process of actually going more scientifically accurate and i'm reading a lot more to adapt my drawings into the scientific realm nice so i can kind of separate keep the fan art to the fans of jurassic park and then try to get my work out there where scientists can appreciate what i'm doing and uh other like dinosaur enthusiasts not just jurassic park fans yeah that's really cool mm -hmm. on your on your topic of uh nano tyrannus versus t-rex it was one of the coolest things that sabrina and i did at SVP was we like randomly got breakfast with Pete Larson one day and uh, nice. yeah so he we're sitting there and he goes like you know people think Nano Tyrannus and <laughs> T-Rex are the same and he like starts pulling out fossils out of his bag and he's like here's a Nano Tyrannus claw here's a T-Rex claw the Nano Tyrannus claw is bigger than the the Tyrannosaurus Rex claw like how could that be possible things don't get smaller as they grow up that's just awesome <laughs> I think that's one of the debates that riles up the paleontology community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it got him going. I think we just mentioned T Rex and that like sent him off on this. Well, he's, tangent. The, he's a T Rex expert. Yeah. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he's, I think he's dug out more than just about anybody. Yeah. Speaking of SVP, I have a really awesome friend in California that he's a, he's, he's a sculptor. That's like his, his hobby. And he sculpts dinosaurs. And me and him are working on some side projects. He, went to SVP this last year and knowing how much I love dinosaurs he actually got me like a care package from SVP he got nice. me a shirt have he got me a pin a postcard <laughs> and uh a, a like a replica nano tyrannus tooth <laughs> nice from uh from Robert Backer which is like one of my favorite paleontologists like oh, yeah. ever mm -hmm. growing up like you guys, because when I was a kid, you saw him in the Jurassic Park commercials where he was in like the Sega game, and then he's like, "Velociraptor, 
this is his claw and he does this <laughs> and it, it was awesome to see that and he sent me a picture he took a picture with all these paleontologists when he sent me one with robert backer and i'm like oh you're so lucky like <laughs> i would love to be there and meet that guy and just talk about tyrannosaurus with him for hours on end there's yeah. always this year that's I'm, true i'm gonna try to go this it's in canada right mm-hmm. yep calgary yeah We'll be there. If I don't go this year, definitely the next one. Yeah. Uh, Bob Bacher is also from New Jersey, we found out while we were talking to him. I didn't realize that. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's news. And he's he's got, uh, he uses profanity like he's from New Jersey, too. He does. He does. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what you expect from, like, you know, a PhD paleontologist, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're very, um. We, we we talk proper in Jersey, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we lived there for a few years. It took us a while to get used to that. Like, it, the people aren't being mean. That's just, like, the tone of voice yeah. that uh, yeah. everybody uses. Because <laughs> we, we, we kind of get that a little bit from uh, New York, you know, New York area. You go mm-hmm. to New York a lot, you have to kind of have that, that kind of way of you. you yeah. Know, a little bit. Especially if you're in New York. You, like, the first time I went to New York, the way that people walk... You, you, you at first you're like excuse me you know like <laughs> you, you adapt to it and you have to like keep walk fast and move around and kind of not care in a way you know yeah mm-hmm. but yeah jersey <laughs> <laughs> i love jersey i'm always defending jersey to people i love i love california i really do i've been there twice i love that place yeah oh yeah us too <laughs> yeah, we definitely like California, too. Well, so I want to ask the project you're collaborating on with your friend in California. How are you working on that together? Is it a sculpture or is it a digital thing? He, okay, he's sculpting stuff. I can't really say what the project's name because it'll give away what we're doing. Sure. Because uh, he told me not to talk too much about it, but I kind of have to say I'm good. <laughs> um, he's sculpting these like scientifically accurate dinosaurs and he is amazing his work is incredible and i'm gonna be doing like mini field guides for them and the box art oh cool Cool. it's like a passion project we don't know we're just doing this for the fun of it right now and if it turns into something later on that'd be awesome you've seen that uh beast of mesozoic that uh david silva's doing right yeah Mm -hmm. i love his work and it's incredible but it's funny that like when he came out with that Kickstarter and that project, me and my friend had been talking about why isn't there a scientifically accurate dinosaur line <laughs> back in 2009? Because that's when me, me and him met on Jurassic Park Legacy Forums <laughs> when Jurassic Park the game came out, the one from Telltale. Mm-hmm. And me and him would talk back and forth. And he, he showed me that he liked to sculpt and he was sculpting the, the Mosasaur from the game. And I was like, wow, dude, that's amazing, you know? <laughs> and I sculpt as well, but I don't sculpt as much as I would love to. I, I love sculpting, but I, I just don't have time for that one. Mm-hmm. But he was showing me all that stuff. And then we started talking back and forth about that. And then we were like, dude, we, we should really, you know, work on something like that one day. And then as soon as we're starting to talk more about it, then we see David Silva just come out of the water and blow everybody away with these dinosaurs <laughs> that he's doing. We're like, oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. And that's, uh, I, se- I remember sending him the link and I was like, dude, he's doing what we've been talking about. <laughs> and uh, my friend was like, wow, those are awesome. And I'm like, yeah. And he says he's going to be doing more and he's doing them by like like uh, family species, you know, like he started with dromaeosaurs first and then and he's going into like ceratopsians. It's like, it's amazing what he's doing. Because mm-hmm. I always felt that was that was lacking out there. Yeah. You know I mean, dinosaurs, everybody makes dinosaurs basically, but it's like there's certain styles that people do and I always felt like Jurassic Park has that movie dinosaur look. Mm-hmm. They got that. And there's other toy lines that have done the same and whatnot. Papo's kind of you know, pretty much they copied the Jurassic Park look. Yeah. We found out that that's what our logo is. I think when we made the logo, we didn't even realize yeah. that it was a Papo T-Rex. And somebody randomly was like, why do you have that Papo T-Rex as your logo? <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know. It works, man. It's it's a good looking T-Rex. <laughs> yeah. Rebor's doing that now. Rebor's doing kind of like sculpts. They did that one Velociraptor called Winston that looks like a Jurassic Park Velociraptor. But nobody's really going the next step and adding the feathers and making it look 
scientifically accurate. There's some toys out there that have done it, but they still tend to like they just add feathers here and there. Yeah. And not really go with like they they kind of like play it safe because I feel that there is a negative outlook to like dinosaurs having feathers for some reason people just don't want to accept it <laughs> yeah you know i just heard the f term for the first time called awesome bros which i guess is a term some people use to talk about you know dinosaurs couldn't have had feathers because that's not as awesome so like that's their scientific I, i've never <laughs> understood that i mean i feel the people that just don't agree with the feathers i don't feel they've ever been personally i've never been in the presence of like an emu you know, mm -hmm. but if you were and saw the claws on their feet oh, yeah. and the way how fast these things are, you, you'd be scared. And and people say, oh, they just look like big chickens. That doesn't scare me. Oh, like, chickens are terrifying. <laughs> even chickens. Yeah. Chickens will peck your eyes out. You know, yeah. <laughs> come after you. You got a pocket full of uh, seeds. They're going to come after you hard. <laughs> if we went to an ostrich farm once. You can feed the ostriches. I don't know why. After doing that once, I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but it was it was pretty terrifying because they they really come after the food. Sabrina looks like she has PTSD yeah. right now because she's afraid of birds. <laughs> Even like a little finch flies by, she'll like jump a foot. They come and they attack me. One time I was just walking and I had a hot dog in my hand and a seagull <laughs> comes and knocks it out of my hands and then dives onto it. Yeah. And a bunch of them follow. You're an obvious victim. <laughs> Even in Disneyland, we were sitting at a table and a duck came up and just sits next to Sabrina just staring like, at her. Like, I don't know what that duck's trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get your churro. Yeah. So we went to an ostrich farm and you you hold out this little tray of food to it. They were trying to take the dish away from her. They would like bite onto the dish and like try to yank it out of her arm. Mm -hmm. It's pretty funny. And their necks are longer than my arms. <laughs> I have three stepbrothers and one stepsister and two little sisters, right? Mm -hmm. We're a big family. We just walk home from school, all of us from different grades of school. And it'd be like a line of us just walking home, right? And we would always stop by this pond in our town. And we'd ask my mom, can we feed the ducks? Can we feed the ducks? And she would, okay, yeah. And she would always have some, because she knew that we wanted to feed them. So she had some bread. We give them like little bread or whatever to feed them. And, uh, there would be like these huge swans there. <laughs> like these things did not mess around. They they just come and start pecking at our hands and stuff. And they're like, grunt, grunt. <laughs> just like <laughs> coming after us, <laughs> like running after us. It pretty scary when you're like little. <laughs> they were bigger than us. Yep. Like taller. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and those weigh like 20 pounds and they don't have any teeth and they eat bread. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you scale them up like a hundred times, give them huge, sharp teeth and like an appetite for people, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> so you've talked a little bit about different mediums you've worked with, sculpting and paintings and other kinds of art. I was just wondering, what's your favorite medium to work in? I would have to say painting would be my favorite out of all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with painting, I if I feel so relaxed when I paint, but I, it's just finding the time to do it. Like if I can have like a full day just clear from everything and just be able to paint, I it feels so relaxing and I just put on music. Most of the time the music I listen to when when I'm painting is no words, just like either movie soundtracks or like classical music and I'll have it blasting and I'll just paint and paint and paint and it's just hmm. the sometimes the stuff I paint is it's not even I have an idea it's just like I just go with the flow with it mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's my favorite out of all of them but uh, the worst thing is having a blank canvas in front of me and trying to imagine okay this is what I want to do but okay now I have to get my hand to do it <laughs> <laughs> like there's a piece that's been kind of sitting that I want to paint that I did like a mock-up on on Photoshop and it's it's called The Last Rain and it's a tyrannosaur over like a kind of a valley and you see the comet you know coming oh, down nice. it's like it's like a meteor shower so and it's called The Last Rain like rain 
R E I D N, <laughs> but it's almost like a a meteor shower, like the rain. It's like a play on the word, mm-hmm. and it's just the tyrannosaur, just like like standing there, just looking at these these rocks flying from the sky coming down, not knowing what it is, and just that's it, you know, mm-hmm. the end of its uh, kingdom. And I was inspired by by um walking with dinosaurs, which I love that oh, yeah. series. And, yeah. and you see that like towards the end when it's like roaring and it's and it's dying because it got hit by that ankylosaur towards its ribs. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> I I I kinda cried <laughs> watching that. Like, no. First Jurassic Park three, now this. <laughs> uh, I, yes, exactly. They just, they just keep killing <laughs> the tyrannosaurs. <laughs> I, <laughs> But I, I loved how they did that in, in, in Walking with Dinosaurs where they kept it. You know, I mean, it's not these are animals they are not invincible. So mm-hmm. one hit by an ankylosaur, like not like Jurassic World where the ankylosaur hits the Indominus right in the face and it's good to go. <laughs> I, I, I not understand how they kept moving after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, all those all those fights in Jurassic World just kind of remind me of like superhero fights like batman yeah. versus superman or whatever and it's like they're not getting <laughs> injured everything around them is just getting destroyed it's the same kind of scenario yeah pretty much even though i i really loved the last fight in jurassic world it was pretty bad <laughs> yeah, yeah it was a good sequence <laughs> yeah but they destroyed like the whole downtown area of that park yeah, more it... than they injured each other until the mosasaur comes in and just ends it <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't really like I know he was really cool and all, but I it bothered me that it was so oversized. Yeah, yeah. Mosasaur, like it was like a big giant whale, and I was like, "What? Mosasaurs aren't that big." Like, yeah, that was weird. Like okay, so they're using the same formula of velociraptors for mosasaurs now. Yep. yep. They did that. We saw some behind the th- scenes thing, and they were talking about even with that brachiosaurus that was laying down and its head kind of popped up after the Indominus Rex took out that whole field of them, and. Mm-hmm. They showed some clip of, I guess, the prop maker talking to like scientists and talking to the producers, and they were like, "Okay, what do you what do you think of this one?" And they were like, "Just make it like twice as big, and then we'll be good." <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I guess we'll just make it twice as big as it was in real life. Sure. Because <laughs> uh, some people, when they think dinosaurs, they think of these these giants, and yes, they're hit, they are giant. Like, but there's a lot of small ones. There's like ones mm-hmm. that are like tiny. And uh, they don't comprehend that. It it, it just kind of goes like, what? That's not a dinosaur. Dinosaurs <laughs> are, are gigantic, you know? And like, no, there's there's ones that really are the size of like chickens. And, and I'm like, velociraptors are really like, what is it? Like a me- medium-sized dog is like their, their size? Yeah, 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 that's about right. And then they'll say, oh, that's not scary. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> let's, let's put it this way. A medium-sized dog coming after you. Like running after you with with those teeth and everything, that is pretty scary, isn't it? Oh yes. Well, think of that running after you <laughs> with razor sharp teeth and razor sharp claws and can jump and jump at your face. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's small, but it's scary. It's <laughs> very scary. Yeah, and even then, it's like that. You know, the small Velociraptor might not try to attack humans if we coexisted. But, you know, some of the larger dromaeosaurs. Oh, man. You know. Yeah. Well, the compies in Jurassic Park. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. That one, like when he's biting that one guy's lip. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that, always, that always bothered my mom when she watched that. <laughs> she was like, oh, <laughs> so gross. Yeah. That was a good a good moment. <laughs> yeah. I love the darkness of, of The Lost World. The Lost World is my favorite out of the series. Yeah. Yeah. It is really good. I actually, yeah, I like it a lot. I even like when they bring the T-Rex back to San Diego. That was like my favorite uh, part when I was a kid. I love that scene. I still do. Yeah. I, I think that scene is awesome. As much as I keep hearing, oh, it's such a cop off of uh, Godzilla. I'm like, eh, I, I, I love that scene. I don't yeah. care. People say that. But Godzilla was just a knockoff of King Kong where king kong came and did the same thing so it's like <laughs> you know people yeah. always pick their knockoff and then they're like and now they should stop after this you know second or third knockoff <laughs> i mean ideas keep getting recycled 
the whole series of Jurassic Park was recycled from Westworld of Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton just redid his idea with dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah. But he hit the mark with this one. And, I mean, Westworld was, was an awesome idea, and that HBO show is great. But when he put dinosaurs into it, especially during the craze of the 90s, where mm-hmm. dinosaurs were everywhere. I mean, you couldn't pass a newsstand without seeing something about dinosaurs. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and what's great, it's like it's coming back, like that whole renaissance of dinosaurs. It, for for us dino nerds, it's always been there. Yeah. But for, like, mainstream media or whatever, it's never been as prevalent as it is now. And, I mean, it's been building up. I can't completely give Jurassic World credit because, yes, it, it built up more after Jurassic World. But it has been building up little by little, especially with all the the science of um, when they had found uh, blood cells in T-Rexes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was announced a couple of years ago. And I think it was before Jurassic World. They yeah. had done a documentary. Then we had Walking with Dinosaurs and whatnot. It's been building up slowly. And I think Jurassic World was the the tipping point where they're like, wow, dinosaurs are back. You yeah. know, and uh, I love it. I love that we're back in this era of dinosaurs where dinosaurs really rule the earth. And it's so cool now to be a dinosaur nerd. Like people appreciate it. Like keep a couple of years back. They're just like, oh, this is nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, yeah, I love dinosaurs too. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but not as long as I, I love them. <laughs> I was here first, loving dinosaurs. Yeah. Be like the the hipster of it, you know? Like yeah. uh, dinosaurs. You, you know, I mean, I loved dinosaurs before people loved dinosaurs. You've got the cake picture to prove it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> got the evidence. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask you, which this has very little to do with dinosaurs. But you have those awesome pictures of tattooed dinosaurs that you did on oranges. Is oh, that yeah. is that like a normal thing where you tattoo oranges for practice? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a tattoo apprentice right now. And I'm trying to transfer, uh, you know, my art into tattooing because it's the new passion I found. It's another art form that I want to try and conquer or get better at. And tattooing is very different from all the other art forms because of the canvas it's alive you know <laughs> so i started out with my practice was doing a lot of line drawings and in between my line drawings i would i started out doing like american traditional line drawing tattoos and then I, one day i remember telling my mentor i'm like oh i mean drawing all these american traditional tattoos i had this idea to like draw like dinosaurs and jurassic park american traditional tattoos and i did like one of them of rexy and it's like he really loved the idea then like i wanted to do more and then when i transitioned into getting my machines and then started like practicing we practice on fruits on mangoes um, oranges grapefruits (laughs) uh, bananas all that because of the depth of the skin it's almost the same with like an orange and a banana and whatnot. Banana is actually more sensitive. Huh. And if you go too deep, it rips through the skin of the fruit. And that's how you know you messed up. Now, in a person, that's, <laughs> you can't be doing that. So you have to. Yeah. So like getting the fruit right is where, you know, once I got the fruit, like the depth right and everything, that's when he was like, okay, you're ready to start tattooing people. And um, one of my last pieces was tattooing a raptor in american di- traditional form and a t-rex rexy in american traditional form on this orange and when i showed him that he was just like that's awesome you know yeah <laughs> and because that's what i want to do later on i want to implement my love for dinosaurs for people that love dinosaurs and want to get dinosaurs tattooed on them you know i mean that's my goal is to be known for animal and dinosaurs and monsters because I see some people have gotten some dinosaur tattoos. The tattoo business has turned now. It's like everyone's getting everything. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, so it's like to be able to transfer that love of dinosaur art that I that I have and be able to put that on somebody's skin where that person's going to be wearing it forever <laughs> and being able to show off like how much they love dinosaurs by an art piece I did on them. I can't wait to do that. And so, like, my last few oranges, I was just, like, all dinosaurs. It was, <laughs> I did, like, silhouettes of, like, all the logos of Jurassic Park, the raptor logo, the triceratops, the, the T-Rex. And then I went and I did the 
the ones that you guys saw with the Raptor and the T-Rex on it. Yeah, it's it's that's the way I got my practice in. And now I'm actually tattooing people. I'm just doing little like half dollar size tattoos off a sheet, which is great. Yeah, I saw one where you did a uh, like JP with like a zero nine. Was that on your own arm? Yeah, that was actually <laughs> the other night. I was helping out one of the other tattoo artists. Um, we had a busy day with like the Valentine specials. And at the end of the night, I had told him that I wanted to get JP09 tattooed on me. And I told him if he could do it. And then at the end of the night, he was like, yeah, you want to you want to get tattooed? And I was like, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I was like asking him all day. I, I love his work. My coworker and, and friend, he's a very talented tattoo artist. And his line work is like ridiculous. And I wanted him to do this JP09 from like from Halloween. We had drawn up the little sketch for it. And I was like, yo, this is a good opportunity for us to do that. So yeah, so he tattooed that on me and it's healing right now, actually. <laughs> nice. Is that your first tattoo or dinosaur tattoo or you got any other it's good ones? It's my first like dinosaur related tattoo. I have only, I really only have the two tattoos now. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. I'm a budding tattoo artist and I only have two tattoos, but it's because of the artistic crazy mind in me that like I'm so like indecisive with what I really wanted to get. But basically that whole left arm that that has a JP09 is going to be the start of my dinosaur arm. There's going to be <laughs> dinosaurs all over that arm. Nice. That's yeah. really cool. That's awesome. And do you know what the 09 stands for with J- on the JP? I saw it, it's some specific dinosaur toy that you really like, but I don't remember which one. <laughs> it's it's the Red Rex from the Kenner line, uh, the, the, the Rexy dinosaur from the original Jurassic Park line. Nice. Yeah, because they all had numbers on them. Uh, the first line and the Lost World line all had these little numbers, and my favorite forever will be that one. So I wanted that one to be the first one to start off the Jurassic Park arm, basically. Nice. So actually, easier way to get credibility for being a bigger dinosaur fan than other people, you'd be like, yeah, where's your where's your dinosaur tattoo? There's, <laughs> that's right on your wrist, so you can just whip it out and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm a real fan. Where's your tattoo? <laughs> And then when I get the other stuff done, this arm is going to look so cool. The ideas I have for it, it's just going to be a really crazy looking arm. And I've, I've thought about it going one arm Jurassic Park and the other arm going all like scientific dinosaurs. Just have dinosaurs with tattooed on me because that's what I love. I'm yeah. never going to get tired of it. It is going to be dinosaur tattoos and somewhere on me is going to be a, a tattoo of my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Cheetos as like you guys seen like my little like logo on my Instagram page is uh it's the like cat with the Cheetosaurus with, Rex. Yeah, yeah. yeah where, where he's wearing a T Rex costume. <laughs> uh, it'll be that. That's great. It is. I've thought about getting a tattoo of a dinosaur before and I always am gun shy because I think well, we have these ideas of what they look like, but say you got a tattoo of what we thought dinosaurs looked like 20 years ago, <laughs> you'd look at it now and you'd be like, what is this? Why did I do that? So I like the idea of doing Jurassic Park ones because then at least it's, a, you know, it's kind of a permanent thing. You can always watch that movie and be like, yeah, that's that's the one that's on my arm. It's that <laughs> animatronic awesome thing, not, you know, some creation that changed. <laughs> that's very true, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's... The- well, you know, you could be kind of like your arm could be a little bit of uh, a pause in time, you yeah. know, like like those uh, the first dinosaurs that look like iguanas that they did in, in London. <laughs> that's true. That's what they used to look like for us. Yeah, that's a good idea too. be like a timeline. Time yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, were those concepts wrong? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, those are great. Very enjoyable now. <laughs> Usually I think I'd like to get just like a. Uh, you know, a skeleton version. Because if you put exactly what they dug out of the ground, it can never be wrong. But then, you know, how many of those do you want? You don't want your whole back to just look like a museum. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Or a graveyard of bones. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The Grim Reaper of dinosaurs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So where's the best place for our listeners to go and find your work? be uh, on instagram because that's under j jurassic which is j a y e underscore jurassic but with a k at the end and basically that's where i put like works in progress 
pictures of my collection. It's just like everything, really. More of my polished work, you would find it on my Nelio Bugalo art one, uh, which is N Bugalo Art um, on Instagram. And my website, which is NelioBugalo.com, where you'll find completely finished work. Great. We'll be sure to post all these links to our blog, too. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been great and learning about all your work and how to tattoo a mango. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was really the question that I was the most excited to ask. So thank you for <laughs> indulging. It was. Me. He's, he's been talking about it for days. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's surprised when they hear about that, when they're like, that's really how you practice? I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean? It's weird, because actually in the old days of tattooing, they would actually, like, this is way, way down the line, they would actually break into morgues and tattoo the dead. Oh, Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's actually where they, because, you know what I mean, they needed real skins to practice on, and then it went on to pigs, and some people still do the whole pig tattooing, (laughs) but the safest way is, you know, by by fruits, really. Very cool. Oh, man. Well, thanks again. You'll definitely have to let us know when your project that you're collaborating on with your friend in California comes out. Also, your The Last Rain image. Oh, yeah. That I'm sounds really to cool. See that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, one more that I, that, like, I want to announce. It's like, mm-hmm. I'm actually going to start painting. I'm going to find the time. And I actually asked on my Instagram for people to tell me their most iconic and favorite scenes of Jurassic Park in the series. And I'm going to be doing three scenes from each movie in different mediums of painting, watercolor, digital, and drawing. And awesome. like big canvases. So that one's going to be pretty exciting to do. Do you know which scenes yet? Have people voted? People have voted here and there. I'm going to put like some scenes up and they'll vote for them exactly. But there's some that I really want to paint that people mentioned. And I, I could say that one of them is definitely going to be... Um, Hammond when he's holding up the cane and looking at it like as his whole dream is like destroyed or whatever it's just like <laughs> just that exhumes so much emotion that it'd be great to paint you know mm-hmm. somebody like there's been like maybe two or three people they suggested that and I was like you know that's a good idea that's a good one and nice. you know breakout scene of Rexy and two T-Rexes Spinosaurus fight you know we get the the regulars but I'm looking forward to maybe seeing if trying to do like maybe two that people pick out and one that's my own that no one would really think about painting Mm -hmm. you know what i would vote for is in the first jurassic park when who is i don't remember what is her name ellie Mm -hmm. the the one she goes down to like do the power breaker and the hand is on her shoulder (laughs) and then she realizes that it's like a severed (laughs) arm i think that'd be a pretty good shot (laughs) yeah that would be a pretty good shot (laughs) Yeah, uh, it's uh, I mean, Ray Arnold tried to give her a hand, but it didn't, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> didn't help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. On that note, yeah. <laughs> this has been really fun. <laughs> it has. I, I feel we've laughed more than talked in, on this podcast. It's a good sign. It is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Uh, thank you guys for having me on here. It's been an honor and so much fun. I listen to you guys all the time. So it was great to be actually on the show. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks again, Nelio, for the awesome interview. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of laughs. <laughs> we did. It's always good to talk to somebody who knows more about Jurassic Park than us and kind of look at it from a more pop culture side of things than always doing the hard scientific side all the time. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Sukumimus, which was a request from Cole via Patreon. So thanks, Cole. The name means crocodile mimic, and it was a spinosaurid with a crocodile-like skull, and it lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Niger, Africa. The type species is Sukumimus tenerensis, and the species name is after the Tenere Desert where Sukumimus was found. Paul Sereno and his team found Sukumimus fossils in 1997. David Verricchio found the first bone, a thumb claw back in December 1997. They found a partial skull and skeleton, and Paul Sereno and his team described Sukumimus in 1998. In 2007, the Furcula wishbone was described. It was found in a 2000 expedition. And in 2002, some scientists said that Sukumimus was the same as Christatusaurus laparenti, which was found in the same formation in Niger. 
Christatosaurus was named earlier in 1998 than Suchomimus, but they proposed that the two were actually a second species of Baryonyx, Baryonyx tenorensis. Confusing, but anyway. <laughs> Suchomimus is part of Baryonychinae in Spinosauridae, and it's similar to Baryonyx, which is a dinosaur from England, and they both had strong forelimbs and large claws on their thumbs. Suchomimus is larger than Baryonyx, but it's unclear how old the specimens were when they died. Suchomimus had neural spines that may have held a low crest or sail. This skin sail, or maybe it was a hump, may have been used for thermal regulation or storing food. The neural spines were large, which might mean it was a hump to support the weight. Really makes it sound a lot like Spinosaurus. It does. <laughs> Uh, Baryonyx, on the other hand, didn't have neural spines, but the specimen that they found wasn't an adult. So some scientists think that Baryonyx and Suchomimus were the same and that they grew neural spines as they aged. But it's not clear if this is true. You'd need to find a specimen that shows the intermediate development of these neural spines to know for sure. Yeah. Or like a really good separation in size or something where mm -hmm. you could kind of see the distinction. Gut contents. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That wouldn't help in this case. <laughs> anyway, uh, Suchomimus, the find of Suchomimus, helped scientists better understand Spinosaurus, as you were saying, Garrett. So Suchomimus is actually more closely related to Baryonyx than Spinosaurus. And that means that Spinosaurids may have been across Pangaea, but then were split up by the opening of the Tethys Sea. So then Europe or Laurasia, Spinosaurids evolved separately from South America, Africa, Gondwana, Spinosaurids. Then there may have been a dispersal event in the early Cretaceous, Europe to Africa, that led to Suchomimus in Africa. Yeah, that's interesting that they say that considering Spinosaurus is from Africa too. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that distinction in what causes these evolutionary changes. Because we're starting to see some dinosaurs where they actually did have a lot of differences, even though they were in the same area. So I wonder if maybe there were different sizes and feeling different niches that way. Yeah, for no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the subadult Suchomimus that they found was estimated to be 34 to 36 feet or 10.3 to 11 meters long and weighing between 2.7 to 5.2 tons. Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that it was 9.5 meters and 2.5 tons. But anyway, an adult Suchomimus would have probably been larger. Suchomimus had a long, low snout and narrow jaws and long, narrow nostrils, and it had a short, muscly neck. It lived in a swampy habitat, but the rest of its body wasn't great for an aquatic lifestyle. It did have powerful hand claws and conical teeth, about 122 of them, that were finely serrated and curving slightly backward. They weren't too sharp. The tip of its snout was enlarged sideways, and... It had some longer teeth, seven on each side of the skull. It ate fish and probably carrion, dinosaurs and pterosaurs, though it's not clear if they hunted or scavenged. And the teeth would have been good for grasping, not slicing. They had a solid roof of mouth, so it could withstand prey twisting in its mouth, which is also probably better suited for scavenging than hunting. But Suchomimus claws would have made it easy to slash small dinosaurs, like Aranosaurus, while holding it in its mouth. Suchomimus fossils, if you want to see them, are in the Musée National du Niger collection. Cool. Now we got to go to Africa, too. There's so <laughs> many places. And our fun fact of the day is that dinosaurs and humans have one major feature in common, and it's the way that our legs connect to our hips. So we both have femurs, and if you look at a femur of a similarly sized dinosaur and you're not an anatomist or a paleontologist or something like me, <laughs> you can really see a lot of similarities and not too many differences. So at the top of the femur, it's got a ball on the end, and that inserts into the hips in both humans and dinosaurs. And they're even at kind of a similar angle. It's not quite 90 degrees. It's a little bit more than that, a little bit more obtuse. And that helps us to stand upright and kind of hold our weight directly above our hips. Or in dinosaurs' case, it's a little more balanced around the hips, or sometimes quadrupedal. But in any event, it gives mammals that have the same kind of hip arrangement and dinosaurs a pretty similar gait. 
And I'm starting to think that that's part of the reason why we identify so closely with dinosaurs and not with things like crocodiles. <laughs> because I saw this recent study where if you take any object and you move it around like a mammal or a human, people will start to sympathize with it. And then if you just like smash it, people are like, oh, no, that poor like little cardboard cutout that you were moving around like how a human walks. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think that might have something to do with it. And then one of the big differences, though, between mammals and dinosaurs is where the ankle is. So even though the femur is very similar, the ankle of a dinosaur is like halfway up the leg. It's way up there. And we've mentioned before that dinosaurs basically walk on their tiptoes and it makes it look like they're bending their knee backwards, but really it's just their ankle is so far up their leg and their ankle bends the same direction our ankle bends. And then they have the knee up above that so they can kind of fold their leg in three equal parts rather than having to bend it in just one spot like we do. So, yeah. Does that mean it'd be easy for a dinosaur to wear heels? They're always... Walking sure. on their toes. Yeah. <laughs> it would. It would look like a lady. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our growing community and either get an Allosaurus shirt or a discount for the shirt for a limited time, then join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.